Hello and welcome to episode number 323 of the Armin Show podcast, where we have been learning, understanding more, connecting with people, sharing concepts about science, economics, and even sometimes creativity. Growth is important, and the more we learn, the more we can do in the future. It expands on itself. On this episode, this is a special one. We have a panel here, three wonderful guests who have been on the show before, each an author, each in their own category of expertise. Let me introduce them counterclockwise here. We have over there, I don't know how it's shown on the screen, but Susan Leah Tao. She wrote The Power of Ethics, teaches ethics course at Stanford, has advised for organizations around the world, and also has her um, organization, Susan Leah Tao and Associates Limited, that does that kind of advising. Susan, I want to welcome you to the show. Thanks, Armin. It's great to be here. Glad to have you back on. Long live connection. Uh, next, we have over there Emily Erickson of Yale Sociology, author of Trade and Nation, which helped us get a sense of the economic history leading to the current moment, because everything in the current moment is always based on something earlier. Temporally, we're connected to the past forever and is currently at Yale. Welcome to the show, Emily. Thank you, Armand. Great to be back. Glad to have you on. And lastly, we have, also from Yale, Yale Law, we have Professor Daniel Markovitz, who wrote The Meritocracy Trap, which is a topic that has been covered. Um, it's a heavy topic this last couple of years because of uh, the upper grouping of the United States and maybe some other countries and what looks to be meritocracy or is it? We cannot be sure. Daniel, welcome to the show. Thanks very much. Nice to be back. Glad to have you all on. So I will lightly guide the panel along. And then if there's any points of intersection, that is great as well. So my start, I would want to go to, because the current moment is based on the past, history of a sort. Emily, I have a question for you. What types of elements from past companies of hundreds of years ago has led to the current system that we have where some companies are really dominating and others are maybe left out of it? And um, what can you tell us about economic thought from a few hundred years ago? Oh. I didn't hear the end of that question. I'm so sorry. It cut oh. out. I heard the very beginning, but not the not the end. That's fair. And so what linkage do we have from now to economic um, efforts from a couple of hundred years ago that companies did that's still applying today? How is that connected to today? Hmm. Well, I mean, so that's a that's definitely a tough question, I would say. Um, it's sort of lots of different um, possible connections. Um, so what is different that, that inhibits competition, mm -hmm. um, eh, I mean, the, the, you know, of course, uh, the, I mean, the companies are, are fairly different in a number of ways from, for example, the early modern peer, period, um, that, that I've done most of my work in, uh, is it, can I say, <laughs> how about if I, if I, um, explain a slight difference that that maybe uh, okay. actually open up competition slightly. I mean, we still probably I, I agree we don't have uh, as much competition as, as would be ideal. Um, but one thing that's that's different is the companies um, at that point were constituted as as monopolies um, with with exclusive privileges to certain areas of trade, and um, and monopolies were considered to be. The right way by many people to do business because it brought order to what would otherwise be an unruly area of, of um, uh, a sort of uh, social and economic life. Um, so uh, they, by virtue of where they're constituted, excluded competition, and um, and that's something that I, I think that luckily we we've we've changed over time um, and that, um, you know, we're still getting conditions like monopolistic competi um, con competition, but um, it's, it's much, that's one thing that's actually much better than it was. 
when companies first became kind of dominant in the economic landscape. Fair point. So the monopolistic change there. Now, connecting to that, Daniel, we have gotten to a point where there is quite a bit of heft on the upper end in organizations and or companies. Uh, where has meritocracy taken us uh, to? So where are we at in the current climate for the people that are not aware? Well, I think you know one thing that is new, and this connects maybe a little bit to uh, the question you were asking Emily, is the rise of a powerful, wealthy, and even dominant managerial class. So that um, you know historically, people who ran companies were generally also the entrepreneurs who owned them. Um, there were, were very few managers. Um, in the United States in 1900, there were large industries which had effectively no managers because there were entrepreneurs and subcontractors. And companies were really nexuses of contracts between owners and layers and layers of subcontractors. Um, and over the course of the 20th century, managers got going um, so that by mid-century, Burley and Means could talk about the separation of ownership and control in which owners would own a company, but managers would control the company. Um, but then in the second half of the 20th century, the other thing that happened is that control was concentrated in a narrow executive elite. So in the mid-century company, there were managers who weren't owners, but the management function was dispersed across the company. There were many, many, many layers of middle managers. And from 1980 to the present, the middle managers have largely been downsized or right-sized or cut out or destroyed in some way or other. So that now a narrow executive elite controls private organizations, controls private organizations significantly even against certain kinds of owners. And that executive elite has become unbelievably wealthy. So that uh, there's a study uh, by Bebchuk and others at Harvard from a year in the early 2000s in which if you took the five highest paid employees of the S&P 1500, so that's 7,500 people in total, their total compensation equaled something like 10% of the profits of the S&P 1500. So you had about 1,000, 2,000 people who were managers who were capturing 10% of the profits of the biggest 1500 companies in America. Mm -hmm. That's new, that's unequal, and that's distinctive to the kind of economic and educational organization that we have today. That makes sense. A small subgrouping is the alteration here. It's like uh, packaged into a little amount as opposed to before it was more spread out and you would have people of different types close to one another. Now, this one goes to Susan here. I wanted to open up the category of related to this concept of um, certain amounts of companies taking over the whole reins. What is the small scale ethics that they have to apply? or should apply in order to um, not basically step on the rest of the companies out there? What, what do the top end of the organizations need to do? Or is there any ethical requirement for them? Um, well, first of all, I think there's an ethical requirement for everybody, um, sort of big or small. Um, but there are a number of, of things. I mean, first of all, companies, um, some that have enormous amounts of power to distribute power, like the Facebooks of the world that are giving users power, or even a company like Robinhood that is giving you know, inexperienced investors power. Um, they have to be very conscious of the ethics of the kinds of power they're distributing. Um, but I think, what we're seeing, just to follow up on, on Daniel's interesting remarks, you know, we're seeing not just these managers, but these managers are embedding their power in things like, uh, you know, share uh, different kinds of, of shareholdings so that they effectively control the board. So it's money, but in addition to money, nobody else can really challenge them. Nobody else can challenge their ethics. Um, so I think if, if what you mean by the top end is the bigger companies, I think they have a particular responsibility because they have particular influence. Um, and I would say they have even greater responsibility today because what many of the biggest companies do is technology infused and they are far ahead of the regulators. So we don't even get sort of a regulatory 
uh, gatekeeping that we might have with something like, you know, cars or something sort of more basic uh, or even food products. So I think their responsibility to proactively demonstrate and commit to ethics is much greater. Um, that doesn't mean that I think they all do it. It means I think they should do it. That makes sense. So it's like a should. It would be a nice thing if that were to take place. And maybe well, I actually think it's a necessary thing, but you know whether they actually will do it is is another story. Right, that makes sense. It's not maybe legally legally required, but it's better for the bigger grouping of all people. That's a fair point. Now, connecting to ethics, but then linking it back to earlier times, Emily. Was there ethics involved in the efforts of the companies of the 1700s, 1800s, that period of time? Did they have ethics in play or was it not part of the system? Well, I mean, so there's always been moral considerations I think, in, in business pursuits. Um, I, um, uh, but the understanding of what was right and wrong was very different. Um, and at, at the time, I would, and it kind of transformed over the course of um, um, the, uh, say, I would say, 18th century. So, um, you know, for example, in, in the English East India Company, um, there, what, there was lots of what we would consider to be just rampant corruption. Uh, and that was a sort of an established way of conducting business. And so people were often, you know, at, um, both trying to kind of pad the, their own pockets when they're pursuing the trade, which, you know, it, it, in some sense was kind of a, a form of profit sharing, which I don't think actually was maybe that harmful to the company or, or, or that awful. But there was also just um, other sorts of bribery, um, favoritism, um, you know, all, all kinds of things that, that we certainly um, frown upon. And then they were involved in colonialism and uh, exploitation and oppression of, of uh, different people around the world, uh, which of course um, is extremely problematic. And, you know, um, it, we can't entirely say, oh, it was a different era, different age. They didn't understand what they were doing was wrong. There was understanding, there was an understanding um, that, that, that what they were doing was wrong and that people were, were dying. I mean, there was horrible famines in India when it was under the control of the English East India Company. Um, there, uh, the English East India Company wasn't directly involved in slavery, but there was certainly slavery uh, occurring in, in the area and, and they weren't averse. Um, people weren't averse to sort of participating in, in the conduct of that trade. Uh, but um, but it, it was it was known to be wrong in, in different ways. It's kind of sort of interesting. Um, Edmund Burke became a huge critic of the company and and that um, and sort of turned I would say turned the tide in terms of understanding what actually constituted corrupt action within the framework of of a business and within the framework even of of, of the government. So it, and that has had a lot of that has to do with the way that the English East India Company was trying to exert political control over Asia and the sort of contest between a commercial entity or what was mainly a commercial entity and the government trying to take sort of more control, exert more control over what the company was doing. And so I would say, you know, so there's, there's, there's ethics, there's moral considerations, but they do change. They do change over time in the same way that, you know, whether or not a monopoly was considered to be sort of a, a, a negative, have a negative impact that changed also over time. That makes sense. Is it fair to say that there was less um, observation of what companies were doing at that time as compared to now? You know, I think it's always hard to observe what companies are doing. I mean, to be honest, it's um, it's one of those things where we think it should be so easy for the government to to you know legislate what's right and what's wrong, or to 
um, or to punish companies when they're misbehaving, but it's 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 always an effort. I mean, so the English East India Company and and many of these other companies, um, you know, they're operating overseas in an era where there's no telephones, no um, satellite. You know, it takes it's just you have to go travel there, and it takes like three months or so to get to where they are. So in that sense, you know, is very hard for the government to observe what's going on. Um, but as as Susan pointed out, now that the, a lot of companies are using technologies that um, that are kind of well ahead of what the government is um, fully cognizant of and, and understands how it works and financial markets, the way these things operate, it's very difficult to have the knowledge and um, the kinds of tools that allow you to observe exactly what's going on. So. I, th I think it's all that's one of those things that's a little bit of a constant that it, it's just hard to monitor that much activity at any time. That's true. It's internal to companies. A lot of things are happening right now that you can't see unless you go in. One time I read a book, Samsung Rising, about the inside of Samsung, but unless somebody actually goes and investigates, you can't get into the internals of uh, the system there. Now, to Daniel, I have a question. Meritocracy, as far as history, is there a history of it? Has it been there a long time ago, or is it only a recent phenomenon that there has been that system? Um, well, so the short answer is it has been around for a long time in different cultures. You know, the original meritocracy was the Chinese meritocracy, which was a test-based system for advancement based on knowledge of certain kind of classical learning. Um, the European meritocracy that was probably the earliest was actually in the English East India Company. In the 1830s, a series of policies and statutes were enacted, um, which were designed to promote people inside the company by examination, rather than by heredity or family connections, as a way of producing more competent. And I think also, although Emily, I wonder if I'm right about this, uh, more honest management. Um, but but that's but so I think that's those are the origins in Europe. I, I don't know what our rules are, but I, I wonder if I can take something that's been said, sort of put some things together and, and maybe pose a question partly to, to Susan and to Emily. Um, so one of the things that I'm, that's, I'm hearing in this conversation that's fascinating is what the objective function of the company is. And uh, you know, one way to think about this, to go back in time a little bit historically, uh, around 1910 or something like that, Walter Rottenau, who was a minister in the Weimar government, was assassinated by the Nazis, writes a book called Of Coming Things, in which he observes that there's something totally striking about the joint stock corporation, which is that it makes it possible to acquire an ownership interest in a kind of economic enterprise without being socially, socially and culturally associated with the work of that enterprise. So before the joint stock corporation, if I wanted to make money from carriages, I had to be a Cartwright. If I wanted to make money from candles, I had to be a Chandler. If I wanted to make money from trade, I had to be a trader. But once there's a joint stock corporation, I can just own a share in something that I have no knowledge of, association with, or anything, and I can make money off of it. And Rottenau thinks that this is going to set in motion a social development, which we are starting to see now, in which companies stop seeing profits as a beneficial side effect of running the business well. So I'm a good cartwright. I make good carts. And so now I make a profit. But rather, profits are the thing the company is after. And, and he thinks that totally transforms what business does, what ownership does, transforms the ethics of management, it, you know, shareholder primacy of the Milton Friedman variety is just the end point of this development that right now thinks gets going when the joint stock corporation gets invented. And, and I guess my question for people who know more about both the history of this and the contemporary practice of this is, is, is this, it, are we really in a situation in which the internal logic of financialized ownership, a financialized economy, in which people can have purely financial interests in economic activity without any interest in the real activity will undermine the ethics of companies in certain ways. And, and, and we can't fix that without fixing the financialization. Uh, or, or, is, or is there a, a less widespread repair of this problem, which I think is a problem we're all talking around in various ways. 
Emily or Susan, do either of you have a re reply to that one? I mean, I think it's a really interesting question because where we've come is almost um, to a point where we can own stock in something we know nothing about, but we may not want to be associated with right. fossil fuels, you know, the wrong kind of pharma. And that's taken, um, that's taken hold at all kinds of levels. I mean, certainly I'm sure you've seen it at Yale. You know, I chaired the Socially Responsible Investment Committee at the London School of Economics. I mean, that was, you know, the students and the, and the faculty and quite, and rightly so, and we're very focused on sustainability. But these questions of, do you wanna be associated with companies, whether you're an investor, you know, an individual investor or a university endowment or a pension fund. So I think it's coming back. Um, you know, we're hearing people like Jamie Dimon say, you know, and the business roundtables say purpose-driven organizations, and that word purpose comes up every 15 minutes. Uh, and I'm not sure anybody really defines it all that effectively, but this somehow this idea that everybody is getting very uncomfortable with the Milton Friedman profit first, I can keep my distance through shareholding um, kind of attitude. So I, I think that's sort of an, an interesting development. And the question is gonna be, are the companies going to actually change their behavior? Um, are they going to do what everybody calls ethics washing? Are they gonna do nothing at all and just sort of hope this all passes? Um, but part of the scattered power that I was talking about earlier about individuals, you know, tech companies and others giving individuals more power is that we're also seeing individuals within corporations, employees, for example, have much more power to try to move things or try to influence things, or at the very least try to disrupt decisions like will Google sell technology to the military or will Amazon sell cloud to uh, fossil fuel companies? So I, I think you raise a really interesting question, Daniel. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I would agree. I, I think it's a, a really fascinating question. I think, I mean, when I think about it in the context of when the joint stock is created, I, I mean, I haven't studied it from this perspective, so I can't say for certain, but, my sense is that um, it was a tool for the a redistribution of wealth. You know, so it, it created more opportunity for people that did not already have wealth. So we're transferring money from very wealthy people that have no idea what to do with them, their money to people that have great, great ideas, you know, about things. And so I think that at, at a certain point, there was a real benefit to this for society. But I also can see that it is potentially not operating in the same way in the current circumstances. And it is true um, also that something that really strikes me about companies um, at this early point, um, and it's almost too bad Naomi Lamoureux isn't here because she's um, really good uh, on this, especially in the context of United States um, businesses and corporations. But there, I think there was a stronger kind of ethical sense that the companies were meant to be serving the purposes of, of society. Um, and, you know, in, in the, uh, the Commonwealth, they were supposed to be doing something that was good for, um, for the, at least the nation at large. And we don't really seem to have the same sort of sense of, um, of what businesses are doing, for example, in the contemporary US economy. I mean, it does seem to be sort of, you know, commonly accepted that they're just supposed to be producing profit for themselves. And what, how and why that transformation took place, it sounds like um, the, you know, this financialization process is definitely a part of it. Mm -hmm. It's like going to that is due to the fact, you know, in 1970, large American companies financed something like 90% of new ventures through retained earnings. And, and that insulated them from the financial markets because they could do what they wanted. Whereas today, when everything is debt financed or maybe financed through new issues of stock, but mostly debt financed, you're incredibly dependent on the investors who can punish you very quickly if you don't maximize returns in the next quarter. Is that a, is that a big worry that you have, Susan? Uh, well, I have... It's, I have a worry about the companies that have enough cash that they're immune to all of that. So again, it's in, in the same way that there are no regulators is kind of a check and balance. There are no investors who are kind of a check and balance. Um, 
and that's uh, you know obviously some of the technology companies. But I was really fascinated to hear you say about the East India Company that they actually had exams. I did not know that. I'm familiar with the Chinese system, but I really learned something there. And I'm just wondering what you think today. I mean, companies to me, they're all focused on what they're all calling some version of diversity and inclusion and dealing with this meritocracy question in different ways and some genuinely and some because they think they kind of need to. Um, and I, I'm just wondering how you see the role of companies in, in dealing with the meritocracy question today, because I didn't realize that going all the way back to East India Company, that was, you know, in the way you described it happening. And today it's happening very differently. Am I allowed to answer, Armin? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. So I think there's a, there's a really complicated phenomenon going on here. Um, on the one hand, meritocracy is the friend of diversity, equity, and inclusion, because meritocracy was self-consciously embraced by American elites and in fact functioned to break the stranglehold that you know, one race, one gender, one ethnicity had on elite jobs. So you know, in 1950, if you were uh, an elite worker in America, you were a white Christian man. And uh, because white Christian men don't have a monopoly on effort and talent, when companies started promoting people based on effort and talent, they got a substantially different elite. And the reason why we now have a female executive elite, a black executive elite, a Jewish executive elite, an Asian executive elite, a Muslim executive elite. You know, the managing partner of Cravath, Swain and Moore, about as old a law firm as you can imagine, is a Pakistani Muslim immigrant. And that's because of meritocracy. So in that sense, meritocracy was a way of opening up the elite. On the other hand, because achievement turns not just on talent and effort, but also on how much is invested in you, if you graft meritocracy onto a society with massive structural inequality, what meritocracy also does is it exacerbates that structural inequality. Because if you go to a failing school, if you live in a community with little educational infrastructure, if you're subjected to lead in the water, if you have food insecurity, if you're subjected to trauma and violence, you're not gonna accomplish as much, no matter how talented you are, no matter how hard you try. And so what meritocracy does in that sense is it exacerbates the forms of structural suppression that already exist. And in that way, meritocracy is an enemy of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And one way to see that in the data, which is totally striking, is that take, for example, for prime age working men, the white black income gap. At the middle of the distribution today, the white black income gap is as big or bigger than it was in 1970. And that's the result of meritocracy suppressing inclusion. Because what's happened is at the middle of the income distribution, the quality of the education that the average white person gets is more better than the quality of the education that the average African-American got in 1970 because the average white person is more likely to be in a high performing suburban school or a private school. But at the top of the distribution, the white black income gap has shrunk dramatically precisely because we now have a meritocratic black elite. You know, so Yale Law School has more than 50% students of color in this incoming class. And our grades and test scores have never been higher. So we're more diverse than we've ever been and we're more meritocratic than we've ever been. And that's the inclusive part of meritocracy, even as it's also the case that the gap between what our students make and what a middle-class American makes, and in particular, what a middle-class American of color makes has never been bigger. And that's the exclusionary part of meritocracy. And those two are inextricably intertwined. Hmm. I have a question here. Uh, the layers came up in the discussion, kind of the layers of abstraction in companies. Is that, this one is to uh, Susan, is that, the, do the layers in companies between people versus people being on the same level, is that where more ethical considerations uh, need to come into place? 
So there are a couple of things about layers. Um, one is that big scandals, big ethical problems, and even really bad ethical cultures can start at any level of the hierarchy. Um, and people toss around this word culture, and I don't much like it because nobody really knows what they mean by it. I, I sort of define culture as kind of what comes out of the decision machine. And decisions are being made at all levels of organizations. So you can have a trader who's really junior, you know, wreak havoc on the reputation of an organization as we've seen happen. Um, so it really matters to embed ethics in every level of the organization and actually even through the recruiting process. So for the first thing people see is that it matters. The first thing that happens to them is that in their interview, um, not so much that they get a quiz about Enron, but it, you know, you're looking at, will they stand up when things are difficult? Um, how do they see complex problem solving and the challenge of balancing profits and ethics? Or what happens if you know, doing the right thing is gonna mean they're not gonna make their quarterly numbers? Um, so that's one aspect of it. The other is that layers um, create hierarchy and depending on the culture, hierarchy can be incredibly dangerous. It can be a, basically a, a driver of the spread of unethical behavior. So we see that to the extreme in certain cultures. Uh, I won't name specific countries, but it's but hierarchy is a real problem where it ends up creating a culture of fear. So people won't speak up. Um, people will do exactly what they're told, even if what they're told uh, they shouldn't be doing. So that's another way layers come up. Um, and then just another, there are many examples, but just one final one is layers um, can create information silos. Uh, so it's really important that this elite managerial class that Daniel was talking about, that they learn how to listen and not just to people that they think are, you know, the board or their immediate peers, but they really learn how to listen to all levels of an organization. And as I was saying earlier, even, you know, when they don't feel like it, even when it's inconvenient, when, you know, large groups of workers are speaking up on certain issues. And that isn't to say that I think everybody should have a voice on everything. Managers have responsibility to make decisions, that's their role, but, um, but they need to be able to listen through the layers. So layers are really important. So following up from that, as far as layers of abstraction in companies, one question I have for Emily is, were there layers that started to develop, develop more and more in the East India company of the past that converted it from a company more towards people and providing a service to something that was taking for itself? Um, well, so, so there are certainly administrative layers that developed over the course of the company. Um, the, um, it started out it, just actually single ventures were, were jointly funded. So you know, people would invest in a, one particular voyage over the East and then bring back and the, the goods would be sold and then distributed, the, the profits distributed to the, the investors um, and, uh, and owners. So um, then it was just too logistically difficult is the thing. And then they found that, you know, especially in the East, um, just, um, purchasing goods, if they one big ship comes in and purchases all the goods, then uh, it inflates the price significantly. So then they had to, to build sort of an infrastructure um, and uh, building that inf infrastructure in specifically with you know, warehouses, which they actually called factories, just the origin of our, our, our word factory. The factory um, was warehouse sort of headquarters overseas location. Um, where they could store good so that they got better prices and you know then when you get to that kind of level you need more oversight and uh you know you start to get so different layers of administrators um and they had a very significant uh you know operation um <laughs> by the end of the time that they that, that company existed so there, there's lots of different um layers of of work and as as Daniel already pointed out you know this sort of modern understanding of administration good good administration and along a meritocratic basis is, is kind of developed there so um did it change the company from being one that was attempting to provide services to one that was attempting to produce profit um for the owners and investors. Um, I'm, 
you know, I mean, they were always concerned with profit, to, to be honest. So I'm not sure that I, I could document a difference in that over time. I mean, they they want they weren't doing this because they, so they, they had to justify the behavior. They had to justify what the company was doing and they had they had to um, they certainly had to justify it because they were given these monopoly privileges. So they had to provide some kind of rationale to um, for the crown or the parliament as to why the company was good for the the nation was good for the commonwealth was was bringing prosperity not only to the owners but to the rest of society um, as so but but they it's but they weren't not concerned with what they were making themselves with their own bottom bottom line i mean they they wanted to to profit also so that didn't that did not change that much i think Here's a question uh, for each, but I'll start with Daniel on this one. What do we do in the next decade that it makes a better use of the current system where a few at uh, the upper grouping have a lot and the rest are outcompeted in a way? Is there anything that we do as the collective? Sure, I think there are a bunch of things we can do. Um, some of them have to do with education. Um, the gap between the amount that's invested in educating rich kids and middle class kids has exploded over the past 50 years. And the gap in the educational performance of rich kids and middle class kids has exploded. Actually, the middle class and the poor have more or less converged over the past 50 years. So the amount that's spent on educating the poorest children has been going up and performance has been going up but it's the rich that have been out educating everybody else. And so one thing we should do in connection with education is invest in massively improving and also massively dispersing education so that elite education and middle-class education no longer look so different from each other. Um, right now, in fact, there are huge public subsidies for rich kids to go to private schools because private schools and universities are taxed as charities, which means they're tax exempt but all, almost exclusively rich kids go to them. And so this is a public subsidy for the education of the elite and that should stop. Um, and uh, those schools should be encouraged slash required to admit large numbers of students, many more students than they do now from outside of the economic elite. So education needs to be democratized. I think the other thing that we need to do is democratize work. Um, that involves a range of types of policies from changing the way wages are taxed, in particular the social security wage tax, which at the moment massively discourages hiring mid-skilled workers, to changing the way in which financial markets are regulated, to decrease the incentive of elite managers to strip the company of workers, to changing the technologies that we invest in, to empower and increase the productivity of mid-skilled workers, to unionization drives, to workplace democracy of various sorts. So there's a whole sort of array of policies that we should adopt at work, which are all designed to democratize work, to empower, improve the productivity and increase the wages of middle-class workers. In the ethical realm, Susan, what might be some things we should be doing in these next 10 years um, so as Daniel said, there are many things. First of all, let me say, I completely agree with everything Daniel just said. And if we take the education point globally, there are staggering statistics like more than 20 million girls will never go back to school after COVID in countries like Afghanistan and Sub-Saharan Africa. And so what does that mean? It means child marriage. It means, it means basically slave labor. It means trafficking. It means all kinds of horrific things. Um, but just to add a couple of different points, I mean, one thing is that um, we need to recommit to truth. We need to stop thinking that it's okay to spread fake news, that the truth is something that's negotiable, that somehow we each get to program the truth to be whatever it is that's convenient for us. And I think the elite, um, we've seen a lot of attack on the elite. And so I think the elite needs to take responsibility for some of that, meaning making sure that um, what they're doing is widely understood, that their expertise is explained so that People from all walks of life can understand it, um, but we need to, to stop thinking that truth is negotiable. There's no such thing as alternatively factual ethics. 
Um, and I think the second thing is just to come back to something Emily said that I thought was really great, which is that back in the day, they knew things were wrong, slavery, for example. And I think today, a lot of the behavior that's happening, whether it's certain things around technology companies or whether it's continued um, versions of slavery or anything in between, people know that it's not right. Um, and we need to start acknowledging that it's not right and not be in a situation where we think, you know, and even looking back at the past and saying, well, we didn't realize, you know, 50 years ago or 30 years ago, you know, people did realize. And um, just to, to, to close, I mean, on Daniel's comment, I sort of grew up, so to speak, at a firm called Sullivan and Cromwell, which is very close to a cravat type culture. And when I was there, there were four women partners, barely, I think there were three and maybe a fourth was made. Um, and it was like something out of a movie that, you know, it was a phenomenal firm. I got the very best training and I have absolutely nothing but the best things to say about it. But at that time, none of the New York law firms um, were diverse. Uh, they've made great strides. And, and again, it's an incredible place. But just to say that it wasn't that long ago. Um, and so I think we need to, you know, what Emily was saying about East India Company, we need to say, we need to sort of face that what we're doing now with certain kinds of technology, what we're doing now, um, even not looking at both sides of the meritocracy that Daniel's um, the expert on, we need to sort of, again, tell the truth about it. Makes sense. And Emily, your thoughts for the next uh, decade of sorts? <laughs> well, I, these are really tough questions for me because I, I honestly, I, I, you know, I'm operating in uh, mostly in a sort of different institutional context, a historical context. So my thoughts for the, um, the next decade of things so that, I mean, I, I, I think these two experts here have given us some really incredible points and are probably um, better suited to answering this specific question. It's just really not in, in, in my kind of um, realm of expertise at this point. More historical context, makes sense. So starting back with Emily, I would wanna go around. Um, let us know uh, what you are working on or uh, goals for the upcoming year, or also um, what kind of uh, message or material you're looking to spread. Uh, so I have, I'm, I'm working on, well, I have a, a new book out, um, Trade in Nation L, which we already discussed. So um, I've, I've been working um, on that and that's charting how uh, conceptions of, um, well, so, sort of the moral side of uh, understanding um, economic policies changed over the course of the um, last three centuries or so. Um, and the other project that I'm working on that I'm pretty excited about is uh, looking at the division of labor, how specialization and, and division of labor emerges in, in populations um, and ways that we can sort of uh, improve the chances for that kind of what is actually very sort of complex coordination problems. What are the chances that we can kind of um, create circumstances to make it easier for people to uh, coordinate and, and divide labor in a, a positive and beneficial way. Wonderful. Specialization is a big thing in the United States as a classic. Now, Daniel, as well, what are you currently working on or goals for the upcoming time and or um, message you're looking to put out there? Um, working on two things right now. One is a short book um, probably calls something like toleration or how to disagree about how to manage profound disagreement. And um, if I can write it, it will be brief. I don't know that I can write it, uh, but I'm trying. Um, you know, it has, as someone once said, many virtues, but it doesn't have the virtue of existing. Um, and then I'm also starting to work on a much longer book, which will be called something like Enough, The Good Life After the Age of Growth which will be an account of how economic growth solved a series of moral and political problems, but is now causing moral and political problems and what kinds of organizing principles and ideals we need as individuals and as a culture to replace growth in a world in which growth is inevitably gonna slow. That makes sense. That's very cool. And then lastly, Susan, what are you working on and or in the upcoming year and 
uh, any message you would want to spread? So my personal mission has been for the last several years, uh, uh, democratizing ethics. And by that, I mean making ethical decision-making accessible to people from all walks of life with or without elite education or managerial titles. So I'm um, working on a very small book called uh, The Little Book of Big Ethical Questions. And it's basically a Q&A that cuts across everything from family issues to Spotify. Um, and the idea is to just spur conversations. It's little scenarios and then my exploration, which in no way is you know, the right answer. It's just a, a way of thinking about the question that hopefully will trigger some conversations. Um, and then I wear two other hats that are um, slightly different. So that's a non-academic book. And I have to say, I'm really looking forward to reading all of these things that Emily and Daniel have, have written and will write. Um, but I chair the London School of Economics um, trustees, the council, and also I'm vice chair of an organization called the Global Partnership for Education. So in two very different ways, um, one sort of elite global education and one really looking at age three to age 18 in places where sometimes there's no connectivity even, um, uh, very focused on, on looking at education. There's a nice interweaving of uh, categories that are interested here. This is wonderful. I would like to thank all of you for taking part in this episode. We covered economic thought, history of economics, a bit of the ethics related to that, and also the current economic climate in the United States. I want to thank Susan Leotow, Emily Erickson, and Daniel Markovitz for joining on this one, the episode of the Armin Show podcast. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Armin. And we are out.